As bad as the devil is, he is not the worst enemy you will ever have to face. The devil's power is limited. In the story of Job, we see that the devil can only act within the boundaries that God permits. His influence over an individual's life is restricted. He cannot do whatever he wants to people. In my opinion, there is an enemy much worse than the devil. This enemy is beyond the devil and has no limits to how much it can destroy a person and their life. That enemy is lust. Have you ever noticed that in the Word of God, we are encouraged to fight the devil and to actively resist him? James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But on the other hand, we are actively encouraged to flee lust. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That alone should tell you a lot about lust and its dangers. In my opinion, lust is worse than the devil. Lust is a significant problem, bigger than you could ever imagine. Even the men who wrote the Bible struggled with lust. Do you understand the implications of that? It means that people chosen by God to write the scriptures also face the challenges of lust in their own lives. This tells me that you and I are not above the problem of lust. Regardless of your age, lust is something you will have to confront and continue dealing with throughout your life. When I was young, I had the misconception that once I became an adult, I would no longer have to deal with lust. I thought I would somehow be able to overcome it. However, as I got older, lust remained a battle. I got married, had children, but lust was still something I had to contend with. Do not fool yourself into believing that you are above lust while you are still in this fleshly body. Lust is an ongoing struggle that you will have to wage war against. Look at David. David was not an average man. He was extraordinary. From a very young age, David demonstrated remarkable abilities. While other boys were busy playing hide and seek, David was killing lions and bears. He stood out even before he was a fully grown man. David's exceptional nature continued as he grew older. By the age of 30, while on the run from Saul, he wrote several chapters of the Bible, including many of the Psalms that still touch people to this day. It's astonishing to think that someone who wrote such profound scripture before turning 30 could later falter. Despite his spiritual achievements, around the age of 50, David saw a beautiful woman named Bathsheba and was overcome with lust. After seeing her bathing on a rooftop, he had her brought to him and she became pregnant. To cover his sin, David ordered that Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, be placed on the front line of battle where he was killed. This leads me to my subject for today, lust. David, a man who wrote significant portions of the Bible before the age of 30, and whom the Bible calls a man after God's own heart twice, was still vulnerable to lust. This powerful desire led him to make a devastatingly poor decision. Lust is a formidable enemy, capable of leading even the most devout individuals astray. David's story is a poignant reminder that no one is immune to its influence and that it must be continually guarded against, regardless of one's spiritual stature or accomplishments. However, today we are going to focus on David's son, Wise King Solomon is the son of King David and Bathsheba, remarkably the son born out of a marriage that began in adultery, is the son that became the heir to David's throne. God chose this son among David's many sons to be heir to the throne and the ancestor of the Messiah to demonstrate the truth that God forgives repentant sinners. Solomon had an exceptional start to his reign as king because he acknowledged God when he became king. He feared and honored God. He offered one of the greatest sacrifices recorded in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 11 verses 1 to 4. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. As great as the story of Solomon is, he did not live up to his full potential. He had the world at his feet. He was a leader, 
blessed and gifted by God, and he had everything a person could desire. However, what stopped him from living up to his full potential was his flesh. His marriages had a devastating effect on him. The Bible says that he loved many strange women, which was the beginning of Solomon's fall. There is no doubt about it. Solomon had a problem with lust. To call it a problem is an understatement. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Can you imagine that? Solomon, consumed by his lusts, could not control his desires. The Bible warns us to flee lust. Have you noticed that while the Bible encourages us to stand up and go toe to toe with the devil, James 4 verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. There is not a single verse that encourages us to fight lust directly. Instead, we are instructed to run from it. This alone should tell you about the devastating nature of lust. Remember, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. David, Solomon's father, had the same problem with fleshly desires and lust. Although, not on the scale of Solomon, David's lust led him to commit adultery and murder. However, David repented and God forgave him. Most people today would never forgive David for what he did, but God is a God of forgiveness, loving kindness, and tender mercies. Solomon did not only marry women from Israel, he brought in wives from different nations. Some of his wives and concubines were princesses from other countries, which God had warned the Israelites not to intermarry with. God knew that the women of those nations were idolatrous and that they would turn the hearts of his people away from him to worship other gods. For instance, Solomon married the daughter of Pharaoh, a foolish thing to do given that the Israelites had already been warned not to take foreign wives. Solomon was trying to form a coalition with an enemy nation through this marriage, directly disobeying God's command. Solomon's downfall was not merely a personal failing, but had far-reaching consequences for the entire kingdom. His alliances through marriage led to the introduction of idolatry in Israel, turning the people away from the true God. This shows how even the wisest and most blessed among us can fall if we do not guard against the insidious nature of lust. 1 Kings 11 verses 7 to 9. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. I find this hard to believe, and struggle to wrap my head around it. Solomon the wisest man who ever lived, fell prey to the same sins he knew were destructive. For instance, he married women from Moab. As a king, he would have known how God destroyed about 24,000 Israelites for committing adultery with Moabite women on their way to the Promised Land, as recorded in Numbers 25, verses 1 to 9. The Moabites were notorious for seducing the Israelites into fornication and idolatry, yet Solomon ignored this history and married many of them. Moreover, Solomon married women from other nationalities, including the Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, all traditional enemies of the Israelites. Solomon kept the enemies of God as lovers, continuing to marry strange women until he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. These wives insisted on erecting statues and idols to their gods, and Solomon complied, turning his heart away from God. Lust made the wisest man foolish, Despite his unparalleled wisdom, Solomon's desires overpowered his judgment. He began his reign by seeking God's guidance, asking for wisdom to lead his people. God granted him this wisdom, making him renowned throughout the world. However, as his power and wealth grew, so did his indulgence in lustful desires. His marriages to foreign women were not just personal failings, they were political alliances that brought idolatry into Israel. Solomon's actions contradicted the very wisdom he was known for, showing how lust can cloud even the sharpest mind. The Bible clearly states in 1 Kings 11 verse 4, For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. This verse highlights how Solomon's many marriages led him to worship other gods, directly violating the first commandment, Solomon's story is a powerful lesson on the dangers of lust. It shows that no matter how wise or blessed one may be, succumbing to lust can lead to foolish decisions with devastating consequences. 
His downfall began with seemingly small compromises, but eventually led to large-scale idolatry and disobedience to God. This serves as a stark reminder that we must remain vigilant and guard our hearts against the insidious nature of lust, as it has the power to lead even the wisest into folly. Ecclesiastes 1 verses 1 to 2, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 17, therefore I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Looking at life, Solomon judged it to be vanity, nothing, useless and meaningless. Even with 1,000 wives and concubines, every part of his life suffered from this emptiness. This is what many people do not understand. There are men and women who think they would be happier if they had more money. We often believe that if we had $100 million in our bank accounts, we would be happy. Some people think that if they had a different spouse, a younger, better looking wife, or a more attentive and affectionate husband, they would find happiness. Others believe that more pleasure and fun in their lives would make them happy. The preacher Solomon, the wise King Solomon, had all these things. He had riches beyond anyone's wildest dreams and lived a life of pleasure, enjoying it to the fullest. Everything a person's flesh could ever desire, Solomon had. Yet, look at what he says in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is a man who had the world at his feet, yet he hated life. He had every pleasure under the sun at his disposal, yet he hated his life. Solomon had the opportunity to test the various ways people seek happiness. He had great riches and could buy anything he wanted. He had great power and could do anything he wished. Besides this, he was the wisest man on earth. Yet, despite experiencing everything under the sun, Solomon concluded that it was all empty. This teaches us a crucial lesson. There are millionaires who are miserable, empty, and unhappy. Pleasure, money, power, fame, and wisdom will not satisfy the soul of a person. Lust lies to us by promising fulfillment and happiness through the pursuit of fleshly desires and material possessions. It tells us that if we just had more, more money, more pleasure, a different spouse, we would be satisfied. However, Solomon's life is a testament to the falsehood of these promises. Despite his immense wealth, wisdom, and indulgence in every pleasure, he found life to be meaningless and empty. Lust creates an illusion of happiness, convincing us that satisfaction lies just beyond our current reach. It makes us believe that our discontentment is due to a lack of something external, rather than addressing the internal void. This deception leads to a relentless pursuit of more, trapping us in a cycle of desire and dissatisfaction. The truth is that genuine contentment and fulfillment come from a deeper source, spiritual fulfillment, and a relationship with God. Solomon's ultimate realization was that fear of God and obedience to his commandments are the true paths to meaning and satisfaction in life. Thus, lust promises are empty, and its pursuit leads only to further emptiness and disillusionment. Allow this sermon to be a warning to you and me. Lust has a deceptive nature. It's not just lust. Sin in general has a deceptive nature. Sin has the unnatural and subtle ability to lay dormant for years. Sin can fool a person into thinking they have overcome it. Indeed, years or even decades may pass, but that sin is not gone. It is waiting. It is waiting for the right circumstances to fall into place. Sin is patient. It lulls you into a false sense of security, making you believe you no longer need to guard against it. As time moves on, you begin to lower your guard, thinking you have overcome this sin. Years can pass. Decades can pass. Then, once the right circumstances fall into place, that sin, which was dormant for years, strikes again and comes in full force. It comes with all its might. That is the deceptive nature of lust. Lust will hide and make you think you don't need to guard against it. Lust will take your family away from you. Lust will make you make decisions you regret. Lust will destroy your health. Lust will ruin your life. It will dictate your decisions. Lust's deception lies in its ability to make you feel secure, making you think you've conquered it. But in reality, it waits for the opportune moment to reassert itself. The danger is not just in its immediate consequences, but in its ability to ruin your relationships, your peace of mind, 
and your future. Lust will lead you to make choices that bring long-term regret, affecting not just your life, but the lives of those around you. Therefore, let this sermon be a reminder to remain vigilant. Do not be fooled into thinking any sin is entirely conquered. Always guard your heart and mind against the deceptive nature of sin, especially lust. I have seen lust join two people who hate each other just to raise a child. I have seen lust walk down the aisle and say, I do. I have seen lust make people ignore red flags and proceed with marriage. I have seen lust lead a man to abandon his loving wife and children for a younger woman and start a new family. I have seen lust make people break their promises. I have seen lust make people spend all of their money. I have seen lust reduce people to tears over their decisions. I have seen lust destroy lifelong friendships. I have seen lust cause people to compromise their values and beliefs. I have seen lust drive individuals into deep depression. I have seen lust ruin promising careers. I have seen lust lead to addiction and destructive behavior. I have seen lust tear families apart. I have seen lust turn love into resentment and bitterness. I have seen lust create a cycle of regret and shame. I have seen lust push people to betray those they care about the most. I have seen lust make people lose their self-respect and dignity. I have seen lust cause irreparable damage to relationships. I have seen lust blind people to the consequences of their actions. I have seen lust lead people down a path of self-destruction. People are quick to blame the devil for their problems, but sometimes it's lust that puts us in difficult situations. The Bible tells you to flee from lust. It doesn't say to pray and fast to overcome it. It doesn't say to sing songs of praise or read your Bible to overcome lust. It says to flee. Get as much distance as possible between you and lust. The moment you find yourself in a situation conducive to lust, don't pray and ask God for strength. Run, flee. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. If it can happen to David, a man in his 50s, no one is immune. If you are a pastor, you must stay on guard against lust. If you have been married and faithful for 25 years, you still need to stay on guard against lust. If you are a young lady with your whole life ahead of you, you must stay on guard against lust. Allow me to make this as practical as possible. If you are alone with someone you find attractive who isn't your spouse, and you see that the situation could lead to fornication or adultery, do not rely on your self-control. Do not waste time attempting to assess the situation. Remove yourself from the situation immediately. Do not waste time trying to spiritualize the situation. Remove yourself from the situation. Do not waste time acting like you are invulnerable to temptation. Remove yourself from the situation. Do not waste time pretending you are above such desires. Remove yourself from the situation. In the bustling streets of modern life, conversations about faith and eternity often surface unexpectedly. One such moment, etched vividly in my memory, involved a husband and wife approached by a curious interviewer who posed a simple yet profound question. Do you believe you'll go to heaven when you die? Their response, delivered with unwavering confidence, reverberated through my thoughts long after the video ended. We're good people, they declared, their conviction palpable in the air. It was a statement laden with assumptions, a belief rooted in the notion that moral rectitude alone could secure a place in the celestial realms. But as their voices echoed, I couldn't help but recall the words of Jesus echoing through the ages. Why do you call me good? No one is good, except God alone. In that moment, the chasm between worldly virtue and divine righteousness became starkly apparent. Being a good person, while commendable, does not serve as a passport to paradise. The Bible unequivocally asserts that our righteousness, when measured against the standard of God, falls short like filthy rags before His holiness. This misconception, prevalent in society, perpetuates a dangerous narrative that heaven's gates swing wide for the morally upright, the socially conscientious, and the philanthropic souls. But the truth, illuminated by the scriptures, paints a different reality. A reality echoed in the solemn warning of Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Enter through the narrow gate, 
for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many enter through it. Indeed, the path to eternal life is narrow, its entry requirements immutable. It is not paved with the bricks of human effort or adorned with the accolades of societal commendation. No, it is forged through the transformative power of a surrendered heart, through the acknowledgement of one's sinfulness and the embrace of God's saving grace. For too long, the world has peddled a counterfeit gospel of self-righteousness, leading many astray with its empty promises of salvation through works alone. But the truth, resplendent in its simplicity, declares that salvation is found in Christ alone, a truth echoed in the solemn words of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. In light of this reality, the urgency of the gospel resounds with renewed vigor, for the time is short and the stakes are high. May we, as ambassadors of Christ, proclaim with boldness and clarity the message of salvation, the message that salvation is not earned but received, not achieved but bestowed, through faith in the finished work of Christ. The couple online that claimed that they were good people and thus believed they would be admitted to heaven based solely on their moral character. Reminded me of a passage from Mark chapter 10 verse 17 to 18 where a man addressed Jesus as good teacher and in response Jesus questioned why he was called good stating that only God is truly good. This underscores a fundamental truth Moral uprightness, while commendable, does not serve as an automatic ticket to the kingdom of God. Despite the virtues of being morally upright and being a Christian, they are not synonymous. Merely being a good person does not guarantee entry into God's kingdom. According to Jesus, no human being can attain the standard of goodness set by God. Our moral standards fall short in comparison. Thus, being morally upright alone does not grant access to the kingdom of God. Instead, the key lies in confessing our sins, being born again, and cultivating a relationship with the Lord. The Bible emphasizes that only those who are born again will see the kingdom of God because, inherently, the natural state of humanity is marred by wickedness, despite our perception of personal goodness. In our society and the world at large, there exists a misguided perception of what it takes to enter heaven. Many believe that adhering to societal norms, paying taxes, refraining from lying, cheating or stealing, remaining faithful in marriage and practicing acts of charity is sufficient to secure a place in heaven. However, this belief is flawed. No amount of moral uprightness can earn one's way into heaven. Our morality and righteousness when compared to God's standards, are like filthy rags, as stated in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Furthermore, there's a prevalent misconception that the majority of people are inherently good and destined for heaven, reserving hell only for the most wicked individuals. But this contradicts the teachings of the Bible. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad the way leading to destruction, and many are those entering through it. Wide is the gate and broad the way leading to destruction. The imagery of the narrow gate and the broad way leading to destruction is striking. It illustrates the stark contrast between the path of righteousness and the path of destruction. The narrow gate represents the way of life, salvation, and eternal fellowship with God. It signifies a journey marked by faith, humility, and obedience to God's will. However, it's not an easy path. It requires self-denial, perseverance, and a willingness to forsake worldly desires. In contrast, the broad way symbolizes the allure of worldly pleasures, the enticement of sin, and the pursuit of self-gratification. It's a path that appears inviting, accommodating, and inclusive, but ultimately leads to destruction. It lures many with its promises of immediate satisfaction and temporal pleasures. Yet, its end is despair, emptiness, and eternal separation from God. 
The troubling aspect of this verse lies in the realization that many are on the path to destruction. Despite the availability of the narrow gate, the majority choose the broad way. This highlights the prevalence of spiritual blindness, deception, and misplaced priorities in the world. It prompts us to examine our own lives and question whether we are among the few who have found the narrow gate or among the many who are blindly following the crowd. As we ponder the significance of Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, let us heed its warning and choose wisely. Let us strive to enter through the narrow gate, embracing a life of faith, righteousness, and obedience to God. For in doing so, we find not only the path to eternal life, but also the abundant blessings of God's presence, guidance, and grace. Try as we may, good deeds don't get us to heaven. They don't. They simply don't. Society views sinners as people who are in prisons or jail cells. But that's not true. According to God's word, each and every one of us is a sinner. From the moment we are born, we are on the trajectory to hell. And the only way we change our trajectory is not through good works. It is simply by accepting the free gift of salvation. Aren't you glad that your eternity is not in your own hands? Allow me to use myself as an example. I thank God that my salvation is not in my own hands because I have made mistakes. I have gotten angry when I shouldn't have gotten angry. I have lied when I shouldn't have lied. And if I were to try to earn my way to heaven, I would fall short every time. But I thank God for Jesus and all he did for me on the cross. I thank God for my relationship with him and all he did for me on the cross. Oh Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There is no other name but Jesus. There is no other door but Jesus. There is no other king but Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and life. Eternal life. The giver of life. All life flows from him. All life comes through him. What I love about Jesus is that he forgives the unforgivable. He touches the untouchables. He finds the lost. He is not a respecter of persons. If you want a relationship with him right now, wherever you are, you can cry out to him and he will meet you where you are. You can be a cast out in society. You could be locked in a prison cell, serving a mandatory life sentence. Society could have thrown the key away for your cell, but right now, Jesus, Jesus, can come into your life and you can have a relationship with him. You can be heartbroken alone, but right now, Jesus, Jesus, can come into your life and you can have a relationship with him. You can be facing illness, and you can be unsure whether you are going to make it or not. But right now, Jesus, Jesus can come into your life and you can have a relationship with him. You can be fearing death, you can be fearing hell, but right now, Jesus, Jesus can come into your life and you can have a relationship with him. The truth is simply this, good people do not go to heaven. Only those who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ go to heaven. You can do all you want. You can attend church seven days a week. You can be baptized in water so many times until the frogs know your social security number. But that will not give you even five seconds in heaven. Only those who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ go to heaven. Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In the final moments of reckoning, when time bows to eternity, and the veil between worlds is lifted, many will be shocked to find themselves standing on the threshold of eternity, only to discover that their assumptions about heaven were tragically misplaced. Like the husband and wife confidently asserting their place in paradise based on their perceived goodness, countless souls will stand bewildered, realizing too late that their self-proclaimed Christianity was but a facade, a veneer masking the absence of true relationship with the Savior. For them, 
the revelation will be devastating. Despite their outward displays of religiosity, attending church faithfully, engaging in acts of service, and even performing miraculous deeds, their hearts remained estranged from the transformative power of Christ's love. In their pursuit of righteousness through works, they neglected the essential foundation of faith, a living, breathing relationship with Jesus Christ. The sobering truth is this, mere religious affiliation does not guarantee entry into the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, many will stand before him in that day, pleading their credentials, prophesying in his name, casting out demons, and performing wonders, only to hear the chilling words, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's a chilling prospect, one that should prompt each of us to pause and reflect on the authenticity of our own faith. Have we truly surrendered our lives to Christ, allowing his redemptive work to transform us from the inside out? Or have we settled for a superficial Christianity, content to wear the label without bearing the fruit of genuine discipleship? In the face of such weighty considerations, there is no room for complacency or presumption. The title of Christian carries with it an immense responsibility, a responsibility to walk in intimate fellowship with the Saviour, to yield to His Lordship in every area of our lives, and to bear witness to His love through our words and deeds. As we ponder the fate of those who will be shocked to find themselves excluded from heaven's gates, let us heed the solemn warning of Scripture. Let us ensure that our faith is built on a solid foundation, a relationship with Jesus Christ that transcends religious ritual and legalistic observance. For it's not enough to simply claim the name of Christ. We must know him intimately, surrendering our hearts to his transforming grace. In the end, it's not about how many times we attended church or how diligently we performed religious duties, it's about whether we truly know and are known by the Savior, the one who gave his life to reconcile us to the Father. May we, like the wise virgins in Jesus' parable, ensure that our lamps are filled with the oil of genuine faith, burning brightly as we eagerly await the bridegroom's return. For indeed, for some who call themselves Christians, it may already be too late.